Um, hello, everyone. This is the uh, South Sefton Scribbles vlog, um, our part of Project Nolan, and it's our first film review. Um, if you've seen the video so far, we're ranking Christopher Nolan's movies um, in our sort of uh, a ten to one, rather loosely, um, on a, and we're going to vlog our own reviews and thoughts on each of his feature films, um, leading up to uh, the eleventh feature film, which comes out in a couple of weeks' time, Tenet. Um, if you didn't see the last one, then uh, Matt and I have already given our rankings from 10 to 6, and both of us uh, put uh, at number 10 uh, Christopher Nolan's first ever feature-length film, uh, Following, uh, yeah. which, as I understand, Matt, didn't get a cinema release. Is that right? Um, no, I think it got um, some limited sim cinema releases, like belated releases after those later successful at the time. No, it was straight to video, I believe. Right. Okay. Which uh, which stands to reason it was released in 1998, and it mm -hmm. and it, it was kind of a, a, a well, it's a first movie, isn't it? He'd made a couple of shorts before then, but nothing yeah. else of note. Um, yeah. But before we get into the sort of discussion of it, do, do you want to give us a quick synopsis of the movie? Yeah. Well, like you said, it's his first film, and it's an independent film, and, and Nolan wrote it and shot the film, directed the film, edited the film, and did pretty much everything himself. Um, and he did it over a series of weekends in the over a couple of years with some close friends. So the film is, uh, it follows uh, a young man, an aspiring writer, and he, he starts following people. Um, and he says he's doing that to get information for his, his books and his stories, but he's just sort of falling into the lifestyle. And one day he follows uh, a man called Cobb, and Cobb confronts him, and uh, he's the burglar. And then so they sort of team up and start to learn from each other. But, but all the way through the film, we're cross-cutting between like parallel narratives, aren't we, between the future events and present events. Um, and then without giving any spoilers away or too many spoilers, they, they start burgling houses together and then they get involved in this larger, well, sort of conspiracy or this larger web. Um, and it's um, in, involving a mysterious blonde woman and um, someone just known as the bald man. Um, and, yeah, and then it, it sort of wraps up at the end like a lot of Nolan films do with a nod to something that happens at the beginning. And that's one of the first things I noticed about uh, the film that sort of leads into his style. Yeah, we're going to discuss his, uh, I suppose, the sort of indicators of what makes this typical of Christopher Nolan's movies. But of course, this is his first one. So it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to take it. When did you first see this film? I'm, I'm assuming it was after you'd seen other Christopher Nolan movies. <clears throat> yeah, well, I've, I've had the VHS for a long time and I can't really remember where I got it um, but I got it after I had the VHS player so uh, this was actually the first time I'd seen it um, ah. for this um, series we're doing. it was the only Nolan film I hadn't seen actually likewise <laughs> okay that's really interesting so both of us had seen all nine of his other movies before coming to this yeah. which it, which makes it all the more interesting because we're kind of spotting yeah. Nolan cues and traits before he even knew they existed. Yeah. Um, so, okay, before we get into the sort of the Nolan-esque elements of it, what did you like about the film? What were your sort of favourite things um, or what stood out to you as a, just as a, a standalone film? Um, I liked uh, the style of it. Um, first of all, the way it was shot, but it was shot on 16 millimetre, which has always been considered like low grade independent or B-roll. And it really, um, I don't know, it gave it that independent feel, which gave it, um, so maybe it made it really attractive. And it's showing black and white as well, isn't it? Yeah, which, uh, and not really much uh, music or any music. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's the the sound, in, in terms of sound, there's very little going on uh, outside of the diegetic sound, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. And I really just liked how, how, how bold it was for a first film, considering he had no real film experience. He didn't study film or anything like that. Um, I thought it was really well crafted. It was really engaging, and for a first film, um, given the context of its production, I thought it was um, very, very strong. Yeah, I think um, it's it's quite clearly uh, an attempt at making a thriller, isn't it? Um, it's oh, yeah. it it sits in a genre of, uh, of sort of historically Hollywood thrillers, I guess. There yeah. are Hitchcockian elements. Would you agree with that in in this? Um, yeah, a lot of um, intrigue and a lot of mystery yeah, and a lot of suspense, isn't it, throughout the film. Um, and, you know, it is usually defined as like a neo-noir or crime thriller. Well, that the noir thing is really interesting because it is Hitchcock was pretty good at mixing up genre. I don't think he really ever gets enough credit for that because it's mm. 
because Hitchcock is always considered to be this auteur who does his own thing, but actually Hitchcock was brilliant at mixing suspense with noir yeah. uh, or suspense with crime and stuff like that. And this definitely is a film noir, isn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's even even got you know the femme fatale, the um, fatal blonde female character. Yeah, I was just about to say I that. Get duped. She um, she's a significant part in the film, and mm. uh, she is completely typical of the the femme fatale uh, role, isn't she? Yeah. Uh, it, she's even blonde, which would uh, match up <laughs> with Hitch- Hitchcock's kind of uh, characters as well. Yeah. What for the viewers who don't know what we mean? What is a femme fatale? Well, a femme fatale is uh, a female character you find in film noir. And usually she's quite alluring and quite attractive and she basically seduces the anti-hero protagonist and lays a trap for him. So um, a great example, if you watch um, Double Indemnity, I can't remember the character's name, but that's one of the classic examples of a female character who weaves this web of um, intrigue and mystery around an insurance salesman and ultimately he takes the rap at the end. Yeah. And... uh... Well, without again giving too much away, that the female lead in this certainly is leads to the, the sort of character's journey through a sort of rabbit hole of of it's London, isn't it? It's set in this, yeah. this film. It's interesting you said uh, anti-hero because I, I guess this is a good chance to move into the sort of more Nolan-esque qualities of it. Yeah. But uh, our main character, this guy who takes up following people. I suppose we'd call it stalking, really, but yeah, uh, he, he is an anti-hero much more than a hero. But his role is key to this, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, completely. And if you look at uh, the character in this one, he has some other traits that appear in various um, protagonists no one has, which is like almost like a dual identity or like a fractured character with his two versions of the same character. And at yeah. the end, there's always some sort of resolution. I noticed this. Uh, what's interesting about that idea of duality is that it's not just uh, the, the sort of maybe that unreliable narrator aspect where mm. he talk, talks to us uh, in a way that we can't always trust, but even his physical identity changes yeah. throughout the film. You know, we we see him at the start where he's kind of this sort of uh, almost bohemian mm. kind of sort of disheveled wannabe writer and by the end is this or towards the end is more suave sophisticated kind of cat burglar type isn't he yeah does that itself reflect some of the kind of themes and ideas that nolan visits again and again regarding duality and stuff yeah i think as you said with the duality of his characters there's always more maybe more of an ideal version or a version of a character that, you know, say the character on the left, the uh, younger character, once they get to this stage, that's represented by the older character. And they, and that then, you know, that sort of drives a lot of his narratives, that, that male character journey. Definitely. Is it significant that he's a male character? I mean, Nolan sort of is really, I mean, if you think of all of his protagonists, and, mm. um, and we'll probably get to this as we go along, there is there is certainly all of his main characters are men. Is is masculinity something that's tackled in his films or that this explores in some way oh yeah i think um, there's different types of masculinity and um i think a lot of his characters thinking of batman or even the main character in this one they're always looking for a more idealized version of it or they've got like a, a an idea in the mind of what being a man is and they feel inadequate in some way yeah i think that drives a lot of the characters especially this character because he's so uh, at first, uh, it's almost like enamoured by Cobb, isn't he? He wants to be like him. He's quite naive, isn't he, in what mm. he thinks. It, starting from his, like, almost this idea that he's uh, lying to himself, that the reason he's following people is because yeah. he wants to be inspired for writing. But it's probably because he's lonely. It's probably because he he doesn't yeah. seem to have any friends, or it certainly doesn't have any creativity that we can learn about. <clears throat> and I think, yeah. for me, that's one of the key things that takes you on to Nolan's films is what I noticed is that this joined up a lot of dots for me about characters that are often lying to themselves yeah. or characters that um, also characters that break their own rules. Um, yeah. He said one of the early things he says is that one of the rules that you have when you're following is never get involved with the people you're following. And inevitably he does this with, with, with more than one person, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, mm. Well, yeah, maybe yeah. You know, it's these like it's like Batman as well, and Cobb, and even um, the main characters in Interstellar. They, they they become obsessed with an idea, don't they? Yeah, and that just drives and drives and drives them. 
Absolutely. That's a really interesting I'm, obsession is something I think we'll probably mm. talk about a lot. Flawed characters. Yeah. Um, that are almost anti-heroes so in their own way they do discuss masculinity which is fascinating when if you consider that he has made films about the most famous superhero there is yeah. um, but that idea of tackling these things is really I think this one almost more explicitly than any of the others it's a film about the human condition isn't it? Um, oh yeah definitely you know I suppose loneliness um and you know living in, in the big city and all that type of stuff but yeah expose that sorry i mean we're going not <laughs> have to cut that bit out uh, call me off guard sorry that's right sorry go on. um and that idea of say uh i'm just throw that. oh yeah so you mentioned it being we talked about it being shot in london hmm. for me that's one way in which this feels different to uh, some of his later films, certainly past Memento, is that this yeah. has got a real quite claustrophobic feel to it, hasn't it, this movie? Yeah, I think a lot of it has. Um, and obviously that's primarily down to lack of budget and lack of locations. I think they were shooting in, like, friends' flats and, like, locations they could get for free. But I read as well in an interview with Nolan where he was talking about those how those restrictions helped uh, develop the film and develop the style. He said he had to shoot a lot on rooftops across yeah. London. So I think even though it is a very small claustrophobic film, there is in the background a sort of sense of scale, if you like, or of, you know, um, space outside. So he's trying to break out of that. Yeah. Uh, um, the other thing I noticed is that that felt maybe slightly alien to Nolan's films was the, and I'm sure this is, again, to do with budget, but the amount mm. of handheld camera there was in this film. That, yeah. that felt, having watched several Nolan films in a row, and expecting certain stylistic devices that felt quite mm. jarring because I I don't think of Nolan as someone who uses a lot of frenetic handheld no. camera. No, I think one of the attributes of his style is so precise, isn't he? Mm. And he shoots like a fixed camera a lot of the time. In fact, the only um, times you do see him use handheld, and again, this don't without wanting to wander into too many other films, he will use it for flashbacks or dream sequences. Yeah. But even then, it's very controlled and it almost has a sort of slow motion attached to it. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to see. Oh yeah. So about the handheld style, um, he is very um, measured and precise in his camera work. Um, but I was reading about some of the the way he frames characters and the way he shoots characters, and you're right that the handheld's unusual. But I think the way he frames characters and the shot choice is quite consistent. Okay. Um, so one of the things I noticed is that one, when he opens his films, he usually shoots from behind the character or one of the early shots is behind. Right. Um, and I read an interview where he talked about wanting to not observe a character like externally. He wanted to sort of put the, he said he wanted to drop a character in a maze and he wanted to put the audience right there behind them. So a lot of shots are behind and he doesn't really use shot reverse shot. Okay. He'll do behind shot and then he'll do cut-ins rather than point of view. It's like at a slightly flatter angle. Right. And he said um, the reason he does this is because he, he can be more artistic with light and colour and, and all those type of things in time. And he said, and they're basically important motifs that sort of carry the narrative forward throughout the film. So like these visual cues are like planted in the narrative. Oh, fantastic. OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so even then, it's sort of marrying up a sort of style with the thematic ideas as yeah. well. And that's, yeah. I that's... thought it was, I mean, apart from, you're right about the handheld, but I thought it was really... I was surprised how Nolan it felt, to be honest, in sure. terms of like the characters and the way it was constructed, but it felt very familiar. I mean, you know, this is, uh, like you said, he described it himself as a zero budget film. Mm. He did um, he did uh, film it, I believe it was like £6,000. I think that was the, the actual budget, yeah. which uh, I know a lot of us would love to have to make a film, but that is really <laughs> nothing for a film of this size, yeah. isn't it? Um so what what um why why is it last on our list though i mean you know something had to be number 10 and you know we're gonna yeah. rant we're gonna go <laughs> on about how good these films are regardless but what what sets this behind is a later work i think you've hit upon it there i think it's budget more than anything else i think the idea is very strong and uh there is a, a, a maybe a, a feature length film in there it reminds me a lot of uh, there's an early 1963 film called The Servants. 
it's very similar. I don't know if it's, it's inspired by that, but its style and story is very similar to that. Right. But I think it's a very strong story, and I think with a larger budget, um, it may have been higher on the list. But given that it's a first film, and given the constraints of the budget, uh, it has to be number 10 on the list, really. Yeah. I think, for me, one of the things, and again, this is, this is like I'm comparing it to nine other movies, which mm. are, are, are almost, you know, in some parts almost flawless, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. But I found it uh, fairly humorless compared to some of his other work as well you know and with an 80 minute movie story has to drive it and i know he's kind of going at those narrative elements but there wasn't as much there are you know his films i always think are surprised when i when i laugh in them yeah because i'm not you know i don't go to watch a funny film but there are humorous moments and for a suspense film i felt he he obviously is is a man obsessed by narrative and narrative devices and i think as suspenseful as it is, I think that sometimes him deciding to move towards those narrative points sometimes misses out on the suspense a little bit. Yeah. Uh, for noir, but you yeah, know, I, w- I wouldn't be sururprised as well if you know he's he's very intelligent, Nolan, isn't he? And I don't think the fo- the following for me it doesn't feel like um, a group of mates getting together to have fun. It feels like a very measured career decision. Yeah. So it feels like quite cold and technical. Sure. Yeah, so that's what I took from it. It's very technical. You, you know, you know, there's the quote about when George Lucas got the deal for Star Wars, a Fox Alan Ladd said, "I'm not investing in the idea; I'm investing in the man." Yeah, and that, I feel like that's what he's going for, and it was obviously successful. Sort of a showreel piece. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually, um, because it does, it, like, even as you mentioned, getting onto the rooftops and almost trying to burst out it, mm. with the cinematography, because yeah. you know he shot this, didn't he? It was he was. Whereas mm. uh, usually a director might choose the shots, and a cinematographer would be behind the camera. He, I believe, he he was behind the camera for everything. Yeah, everything. Okay, so we talked about some of the the, the sort of thematic elements that uh, join this to other films, things like the sort of flawed protagonist, human condition, uh, duality, and that. Are there any other aspects which might <clears throat> link this in with the the sort of uh, auteur theory, things that we <clears throat> that might foreshadow other things that we could look for? from yeah. a technical or thematic or even a, a, a industry point of view. Yeah. Um, I think the first point to make is when we first talked, we introduced the OTA theory very quickly, but a modern element or a modern addition to the theory is like the idea of um, a brand director now. So I think by, he set a stall out quite early with this film, didn't he? And his key brands, apart from the genre, is obviously playing with time and narrative. Yeah. And um, so I think that's the standout feature but I think he, he's, if you look online for Nolan films about narrative, it's all def- defined as non-linear. Um, but his films aren't. No. <laughs> the, the, the correct way to look at it, it's very linear, actually. Um, and it's more of a, a manipulation of time and chronology rather than, um, you know, it's not placing scenes out of order. That's very different from a non-linear film. I think this will be something that we'll end up having a, a much sharper conversation on when we get to Memento because... Yeah. Uh, that's such a linear film <laughs> in, yeah. in told in a very odd way. But uh, but you're right, it, the idea of manipulating time, and I think for film students, it's always really interesting to realise that there are different types of time yeah. within a movie, um, and this is certainly one of those, isn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, you can study any of Nolan's films. It's the hallmark of his work, isn't it? I remember when Dunkirk was announced, and the first question we had was not what he's going to do with genre or sound or anything like that it's how is it going to play with narrative and time my my first prediction for <laughs> tenet and i mm-hmm. i <clears throat> bear in mind i don't know anything about this is that notice that the word itself was a palindrome mm-hmm. and i've just got this funny feeling about the structure of the film as well mm-hmm. and uh that that uh that, that that's might be significant but luckily, this is the first of the 10 videos we'll make, and it'll be yeah. far enough away that if I'm completely wrong, no one will remember I said that. So it's, I'm, it'll I'll fit be... <laughs> in with the style. I mean, I think all of us films are bookends with the same scene, basically. Absolutely, yeah, so. without doubt. And this has a, a flashback element to it as well, doesn't it? Um, yeah. And actually, that's interesting, because the, um, the person, well, without giving, this wouldn't spoiler it, I don't think, but um, the flashback element of this film is that he's, uh, having a conversation with someone, isn't he? It's yeah. uh, and um, you don't the, the person he's conversing with is unseen, um, and with that I won't say who it is or their role. But the actor actually, uh, do you know who the actress who's who's no. talking to? 
it's actually a, uh, someone called Jonathan Nolan. Um, oh, right. And it's his uncle, it's Christopher Nolan's uncle, oh, right. uh, which I had no idea about. Uh, but he makes an appearance in the uh, Batman Begins and the Dark Knight Rises, as well as a member of the Wayne Enterprises board. Oh, yeah, um, uh, and that that's another sort of less artistic aspect of the auteur theory, but yeah. working with the same crew, because um, this is obviously his first <laughs> film. But Emma Thomas, uh, yeah. who is Christopher Nolan's uh, producer for all of his movies, and his wife is the producer on this film. Uh, he works with a, a musician called David Julian, I think, no. who did the music for Insomnia and Memento as well. Um, of course, later on, we'll talk about Hans Zimmer yeah. at length. But so already we see that Nolan is quite sort of loyal with the people he works with, isn't he? Oh, yeah. And I think the majority of his films, he's had co-writers and usually his brother. And even and um, Batman Begins, he's, he, he's co the co-writing credit goes to David Goya, I believe, for his brother is an uncredited um, screenwriter or story editor as well. Yes, yeah. And I found it's an interesting point about Ote because I found in my list as I went through the films towards the end of the list generally are the ones he's written with his brother. Um, and also, you know, although she doesn't get a credit, Jonathan Nolan's um, partner is a writer as well in Westworld and he wonders with all these different influences. Like, yes. It really brings to question who is the true author of a film and, you know, exposes the auteur theory, really. Right, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Because, see, I mean, he he's very open about how important his brother is. Um, and yet you very rarely see him interviewed, uh, yeah. in the, you know, at the same time. That's really interesting. Is it someone, Joy, is Jonah? Someone? Uh, oh, I can't remember, to be honest. Yeah, Hannah Joy. Or I can't remember her name now, but yeah, definitely um yeah J jonathan nolan or jonah as i, I believe mm -hmm. is is known is a, is, a, is a, such an important part of these films isn't he oh yeah um, and that's and, and following is an original story isn't it yeah i think yeah. it was just written by nolan himself right yeah. excellent uh yeah are there, are there any other aspects you've uh, you noticed or that we should talk about if discussing this film um well um but well, usually it's just this cross-cutting of now. I mean, we'll go into this more of Memento, um, or the way he cross-cuts the stories, um, or the cross-cuts between the different nar parallel narrative strands. One thing that is obviously missing is the music. Yes. And that's something we'll talk about in his later films when he starts working with Zimmer. Um, I noticed, and then there's a bit of reading about this, there's a very specific technique he uses every time he cross-cuts between narratives. So, um, yeah, we you get a sense of that building already, but without the other element. Definitely. Uh, and the narrative is going to define so many of our conversations uh, throughout these these reviews. And um, the one point I wanted to sort of just mention, I'm always hesitant to this because Chris Nolan is really not someone you would uh, label as a sort of postmodern filmmaker. He doesn't use lots of intertextual references and, uh, you know, uh, sort of me anything we might call meta. But inevitably, a film that messes around with narrative can be read, even if it's yeah. intentional or not, as being a film about films. Yeah. And I, you know, I think a lot of Nolan's films are about films as much as he'd like to perhaps distance yeah. himself from that. This is a film about con men and tricksters and people who enjoyed being fooled, if you like. Yeah. And that's the audience, isn't it? We we, we love cinema because it, it we like we like to allow ourselves to be tricked. Oh, yeah, definitely. And again, that's across all of his films as well. And, you know, we, we, we can talk about him, you know, as an artistic filmmaker and all that type of stuff, but at his core, he is, you know, a Hollywood blockbuster filmmaker. Yeah. And he just does it better than anyone else. And the twists, are, you know, they're what, you know, really appeal, I think, for a lot of people. There's, and again, that will be a, something that we, I don't, <laughs> we probably won't dwell on before it goes around in circles, but... I think there's a film that's going to be near the top of both of our lists, I think, which is almost exclusively about filmmaking, possibly. Mm. But uh, but yeah, I could see it in this, and I was a bit surprised that even at this early stage, he's making films about films. Yeah, that's so, it. I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it, all of his films just force you to think about the construction of the film as you're watching it. Yeah. So yeah, very interesting. So, OK, so it, like you said, for both of us, this is the first time we saw it. You've got it on VHS. It's not really a medium I expect any of our no. uh, students or anybody watching this will find it on. Uh, 
uh, where did you watch it in the end? Because I don't, I don't suppose you watched it on your old VCR, did you? Um, I think it's on Amazon. I think I watched it on Amazon. Okay, uh, there is Amazon. a there is a version on YouTube, I believe. I think uh, may have been YouTube. There's I watched uh, one of the films on Amazon. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's if you are looking for it and you find a copy, it's about eighty-seven minutes long, isn't it? So if you think yeah. that it's been cut already, that is the actual length. Mm. Um, it's definitely worth a watch. I I loved it. Um, and, and as a film that I've only seen once because of this project, I'll, I'll enjoy revisiting um, yeah, and it'd be interesting to see if he ever kind of remakes it in his own way at all, it's all yeah. as filmmakers do. Brilliant. OK, um, excellent. Well, thanks for that, Matt. I think um, we've we've kind of covered quite a lot there. Um, yeah, and um, I think our next uh, review when we go back to it will be on Insomnia, uh, which was Nolan's third movie. All right, but for now, uh, thanks very much for everyone joining us and watching. Please leave any comments you have at the bottom, uh, particularly if you've seen the movie. But until next time, uh, cheerio. Bye-bye.